Hi, and welcome to Illinois, I almost said Illinois Gardener. Welcome to Mid-American <laughs> Gardener. We're glad that you've joined us. We are here to answer questions that are very important right now in our region, which is Mid-America. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department, and that's in the College of ACES here on the Urbana campus. Now, there are three highly intelligent people right here next to me. Let's find <laughs> out who they, they're looking around. Let's find out who they are and their expertise, and then you can um, really gauge your questions towards their expertise. Let's start first with Chuck Voigt. Hi, Chuck. Hi, Diane. I am Chuck Voigt. I'm also in the Crop Sciences Department, uh, Horticulture. My area of specialization would be vegetables and herbs. Uh, although I can, you know, I can do other things as well, but hopefully we've got things covered. Uh, tonight, I brought uh, a little special here. Uh, it's an olive tree. Uh, I, I had uh, Linda Franzo up from <clears throat> the, the uh, New Orleans area, and she brought a few uh, uh, olive plants up to the to the program. And which was Herb Day? It right? was Herb Day. Herb yes, Day. it was Herb Day. So it was in January, but fortunately I have some greenhouse space, so I I took it in there. It was out in the in a in my plant area during the the summer. It was outside last summer, and <clears throat> when I repotted it, I stood it up straight. But it it's got this one branch that that really wants to go and be weepy. Um, so the next time I repot it, I'm going to try to be hard hearted and, and and straighten it up and maybe cut that back a little, maybe try to root a cutting. Uh, but it did, it, even last year, it had a few flowers on it. They, they didn't amount to anything, but you know, by taking this in and out for a few years, you know, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pick a fresh olive one day. That would be great. That would be great. But it does, the weeping habit is quite interesting. And it is, it is. And, we'll and, see if it stays that you know, way. When, when we see those 2,000 year old olive trees in the old country, uh, they have these big gnarly trunks and I was amazed that, that this one is already getting kind of gnarly and knobby down at the base already. So, uh, as a youngster, yeah, it. it you know, I'll, I'll show that to Phil Nixon. It might make a a, a bonsai uh, subject Ooh, if if the trunk. That's uh, what it is up already. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Chuck. That was very very interesting. All right, we're going to go next to you, Jennifer Fishburn. Hi, Jennifer Fishburn. I am a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension um, in. Sagamon Menard and Logan counties. And I like to talk about the same thing Chuck does, vegetables and herbs, but I'll also talk about flowers and um, ornamentals and fruits mm -hmm. if needed. Um, my show and tell this evening, I brought Virginia bluebells from my yard. Um, they are naturalized with, among my hostas, and by the time the hostas come up and get full, um, the bluebells are starting to die back. Um, I highly suggest these to add some color, spring color to your yard um, by taking advantage of some native plant cells in your area. I want you to know I'm making a note about that plant combination. Hosta. I really like that, hostas and bluebells. Ooh, very nice. You learn so much. <laughs> <laughs> and that's such a nice plant. I love that it's got pink, purples, and blues on it all at once. It's that's beautiful. really very pretty. Okay. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And then we're going to go to the guy right next to me, and this is Dr. Don White. Yes, I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology. I taught uh, introductory plant pathology, diseases of field crops, and of course, in diseases and ornamentals and turf grasses. And I just recently have become a master gardener. Yay! Most of it was taught by people I had in class. <laughs> Which, which is great. Yeah, not you. You're the only one. <laughs> and my show and tell, Diane gave me an F for this flower arrangement oh, here. She <laughs> wasn't this, too happy with it. I mean, the, the design's okay. It's design. just the just, plant material. Yeah. And uh, this is garlic mustard. Oh. And this is a scourge of the woods. This plant was brought into the U.S. from Europe uh, as a food flavoring plant. And if you take it and smush it up, it, it does actually have a little bit of a garlicky uh, smell to it. The problem is it just takes over. It gets very small seeded, the seeds will last forever, and uh, it's hard to get rid of. What you got to do is if everybody who's watching would go out and pull about 15 pounds of this stuff, put it in a plastic bag and feed it to the trash man. <laughs> now I don't usually think in terms of feeding it to the trash man, but if you lay it down in the woods, even with this little bit of flour on there, it'll go ahead and produce seeds, and lots of seeds. 
So this is a plant that's really hard to contain and we could use everybody's help. I literally walk in the woods with a plastic bag and my goal is to fill a bag a day, but work and life happens, but you cannot keep ahead of it. I pull, I pull it and I, I can just barely hear the little screams and it's just wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen recipes for uh, pesto made with it. So oh, as you're no. pulling it and bagging it, you could eat some of it just for revenge. Well, that's true. <laughs> so if 85 million people would make pesto, We'll still have some, but it would yeah. be a little bit better. So thank you for bringing that beautiful yeah, floral design. Wonderful. By the way, I followed him. Balanced. My floral design class was actually after his plant pathology lecture. So I got to follow him in lecture in the lecture room. Very interesting as always. Okay, we now have a special did you know that we're gonna go to. <laughs> great to have the climbing plants going with some of the others so sunflowers are so voracious feeders that I would question how well the cucumbers are going to do at the base of a sunflower but mm -hmm. that's just me because they, they suck water and nutrients and everything mm -hmm. and pretty much even keep weeds at bay under themselves once they're big and established I had uh, tomatoes <coughs> use them as supports inadvertently I mean I didn't <laughs> plan for it but uh, the sunflowers were a good support for tomatoes, so if they come together at a different point, not right at the base maybe, who knows. Yeah. So, But anyway, we want to go to the phone lines next, and let's talk to Tammy. She has a question about shrubs on line one. Hi, Tammy. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, my question tonight is shrub-related, and I know that the name of this shrub, I'm going to botch it terribly, and nobody's going to know what I'm talking about, but I think it's called something close to a wigella. Oh, you were pretty close. What is it? Well, I say Wygela. Do you say? Wygela? I say Wygelia. Wygelia. So there's several ways that you I'm can. <laughs> so I'm probably the one odd man out. But anyway, you did. I'll agree well. with you. That way we're tied. Okay. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Don. Okay. What's your question about it? I bought one in a pot 15 years ago when I moved into my condo and put it off the back of my back patio. And it loves that space. The sun is perfect for it. And it would flower over and the branches would weep and it just was beautiful and between four and six inch or feet in diameter and just bloom 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 all the time um, but after I don't know five years or so it got to the point where it wasn't cascading anymore it was just going straight up and finally it's now into its 15th year it was it didn't bloom over at all and it was eight feet high and I couldn't even stand on my deck to, you know, trim the very tops of it when I'd have to trim it back because it just grows and grows and grows like crazy. The so last fall, I took it down to about three feet into the branch and, you know, that's all been sticking up out of the ground. It's been a beautiful plant for 15 years, but I'm not seeing any growth yet this spring. Am I just not being patient enough? Patience is a virtue this year. Um, everything's really late. I know my rose bushes have just started to peek out. So it, I think there's still a possibility of time. Um, what you might want to try in the future is selectively pruning, maybe do a third of the oldest um, stems each year. That'll give you a little bit more desirable look. Um, and keep in mind that they are a rather large plant, so it, it may not be the optimal you know, uh, plant for that spot. And, and it may not bloom this year if you've trimmed it last year, depending on when you trimmed it. So treat it like a lilac, where you take a third out of the older growth and do that for three years. Okay, well maybe we lost her. So that will help you with the Wygela, the... Wygelia. So here we have two <laughs> pronunciations, half and half here on the show. Okay, let's go to line four, and Kathy has a question about tulips. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I have a friend who's a master gardener in Memphis. She ended up um, you know, they, their tulips down there are annual, so they, they just pull them up every year and throw them away. She gave them to me, and they still have the stems on them, um, and I'm wondering whether or not I should plant them now or if I should dry them and keep them for the fall. So the leaves are green, attached to the stem, attached to the bulb, correct? There are no leaves on it. It's just basically the stems. Hmm. But there are roots. Yes, yeah, right. Where did the leaves go? The, 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know because if you pulled the them off. leaves. They are... dug them up, um, and I'm going to go out and look. Because um, the leaves well, are the most important yes, part. Yes, they do have leaves on. Them. Oh, yes. good. They do. Well, then yes. you're going to do something called healing in, unless you can get them planted right away. But healing in, you put them in a soil trench, and you let the it's not going to look great, so maybe do it out in a nursery area or place that's a little bit out back. And then let the leaves naturally ripen, go yellow, and then you can trim those off. You can dig the tulip bulb and then move them to their permanent spot. But it's called healing in, and Arboretum, Botanic Gardens do them all the time. When they lift them as an annual, we can grow them as perennials, but as an annual, and they put them out back. So you can get that to flower on. It's just, it's not as long lived as daffodils would be. Anyone want to add anything else? I've well, if, if you don't heal them in and you were to just leave them be, um, they're not going to be able to photosynthesize enough to make enough energy for the bulbs to be able to come back for the following year. So that's really critical. And to all the viewers, as your daffodils, hyacinths, tulips are blooming, make sure you let those that foliage yellow before you remove it from the plants so that they can um, be beautiful again next year. So if you have them in the front of your garden, next time you plant something, don't do that. Plant it in the mid border or the background because that's, that's all that shows up at this time of the year. So make sure you cover it with companion perennials that are gonna hide that ugly ripening lighter green foliage. Let it get almost yellow green and then you can take it out. Okay, thank you for the tulip question. That's one of my favorite <coughs> ones to talk about in class. All right, now we're gonna go next to a line two question on chestnuts with Tom. Hi there, Tom, line two. Line yes. two? Yes, I'm here. Hi there. And what's your question? My question, I have an American chestnut tree that I want to give to a friend, and uh, he has a guy lined up to uh, with a spade to do the job but it's, it's beginning to bud out. Is this a good time to move it? Well, I would think ideally you're gonna wait on most, I don't know specific to the chestnut, but most of your trees, they are gonna field dig those in the fall. Um, so it may be best to wait till then. It depends on the size though. Yeah, I don't know what we're it? talking. If we're talking a half inch, two inch caliper. Well, it's, it's probably uh, 10 feet tall. Oh. And how big around would you say? Well, it's uh, like diameter. Uh, approximately six feet around. It's like no, a no, two no. Inch. branches. No, I mean the uh, trunk. The, the trunk. The main trunk is it two inches across or? Oh no, no, it's not that. Uh, it's not that oh. big. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, the tree spade. Then you might be able to get <coughs> enough yeah, leaves if you move quick. Yeah. Yeah. The sooner the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then don't plant it too deep. <coughs> yeah. Plant it on a little bit of the high side mulch it in. With a spade, it's probably gonna, if you dig the hole, it's gonna drop it right in. Right. Well, I'd if put a little been, soil in there. If it hasn't mm -hmm. been in a nursery where the soil is dumped up over it, it's not gonna be an issue. Yeah, okay. But still, people plant, that's what kills trees the most, is planting them too deep. It and make sure he deep. waters it throughout the summer. I know that may not, <coughs> that may sound kind of like everybody should know that, but we're getting a lot of calls this year on people that forgot to water last year and now things aren't coming back. So water is going to be really critical this summer. And it's really an American chestnut. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's what he had said. Yeah. Really an American chestnut. So, hope so anyway. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's go back around to a show and tell with you, Chuck. Okay. Tonight was small fruit night in my, in my class. And for that one, I, I like to bring in dried fruits of different types. So, uh, we brought in uh, dried blueberries which they're kind of small, so I, I suspect these are probably the, the low bush main blueberries. And so those, those are pretty neat. Uh, this is interesting. The, the Zant currants are really little raisins. The, Tip that forward. Yes, I will. Yeah. There you go. There they are. They're, they're really little raisins. They're not really currants. Uh, there are dried currants, but these aren't them. They're little tiny grapes that are on, on little, little bunches and, and they're, they're Corinthian grapes, and somehow Corinthian became uh, currant. So hmm. uh, when, you, when you get currants in your scone, chances are very good that they're little baby raisins and not, not really currants. Uh, dried cranberries, craisins, were invented at the University of Illinois by our food science department. Uh, they, the original formulation, they had more sugar than cranberry, 
and because Tip that forward just and, a little bit. Sure, and and because and because uh, people don't like to see sugar as the first ingredient in things, they change the formulation so there's slightly less sugar in them now. But if you've ever <clears throat> just chewed into a, a raw cranberry, they're pretty sour, and it takes quite a bit to uh, to, to do away with that. Um, and then the golden raisins, which are my favorite raisin. I, I'm not a big fan of the brown ones, but these are the same type of grape, but uh, they have been uh, cured, been dried with burning sulfur, and so uh, they, they maintain their, their golden color and pick up a little sulfur. And to me, they taste, they taste more like um, grapes than the regular raisins. The regular raisins are put out on trays in Fresno, California, and they're, they're sun-dried, and the sugar that's in them caramelizes. That's why they get the brown color. Hmm. So just some interesting uh, dried small fruits that you might, uh, when, you, when you go into a big grocery store, you might, uh, you might find those and, and many others as well. The dried cherries have, have really, really helped the cherry industry in Michigan, for instance. And they, they keep so well, and you can use them for lots of different things. So yep. very good. Thank you, Chuck. Good variety. Okay, Jennifer. Um, I have a viewer question, okay. and it is, uh, they planted blueberries and they want to know what fertilizer they should use. Um, for our viewers out there, um, as far as blueberries go, m the biggest, the most helpful thing that you can do for blueberries is to make sure the soil is correct before you plant them. So it may take a couple years of either amending your soil or putting in a raised bed before you actually put in your blueberry plants. That's gonna be the most crucial thing to do because they need a soil pH of around five, which um, especially in central Illinois, we really don't have that. And, um, so some of the viewers out there may be, may be fortunate to have those conditions, but if not, um, they're gonna need to amend with some sphagnum peat um, and other amendments. And then um, for the first year when you plant those out, you wait about a month and then fertilize that um, area in about a 12 inch band, keeping away from the, from the stem. And then uh, each additional year, you can increase the amount of fertilizer and increase the width that you're putting that fertilizer in. And, I would say um, most people don't spend enough time pre-prepping the soil. Yeah, we, we tend to think that it's okay to plant in a 7 pH and then bring it down, but it, it's really uh -uh. not. You really have to do all that preparation work. We're all shaking time. our heads. It's not a good idea. So plant but try, ahead. But if you don't have it and you get, and you get an inexpensive blueberry bush, plant it anyway and just enjoy the few fruits you get. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of hundreds of right. thousands. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And now Don. Yes, I, the question I have is, is the viewer says that I have a 75-year-old maple tree that's bark on one side of the lower base of the uh, tree is turning an ash white color. And she hasn't noticed any bugs. And could you tell me what's causing the discoloration? Also, would spraying or the discolored bark with tree paint help or harm the bark? Leave it alone. It, just enjoy the white. Now, let me... This might just really fit with a, with a phone question we've got coming up. It's going to be on line five. I suspect that what you're looking at there is lichen growth. And I've got some in the woods that look like somebody took whitewash and painted big old blotches on the stem. Uh, it's the lichens. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll see trees that will have big streaks on them. And it's lichens. A lot of times what will happen is if you have a dead branch, the sap in the tree will ooze out onto the surface and run down the tree, and you get a little bit different lichen growth there than you do on the remainder of the tree. It's not harmful. I wouldn't worry about it, and uh, we'll see what caller on line five has to add for that. Hmm. Well, why don't we go to line five, and it is about lichen on tree. Judy, line five. It's Katie. Oh, Katie. Well, let's talk to you, Katie. <laughs> All right. Um, I was noticing in my yard the other day that almost all of my trees, and we're talking a lilac bush, cherry tree, dogwoods, uh, apple, they all have this blotchy, splotchy, bumpy lichen on it. It's kind of a greenish, greenish gray, I would say. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering, is this bad or... Is there anything I should do about this or just leave it be? I don't think there is anything you can do with it. And uh, I think just join the crowd. There's a lot of it around this year. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's really a sign of clean air. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. back when, we, when there was a lot of industrial pollutants in the air, 
we couldn't grow lichen. So it's actually a sign of, of, a, of a healthy environment that's getting better. So uh, kind of that's what that's what would grow on a tree naturally out in the pristine forest. So kind of just celebrate that we're closer back to that a little bit. Well, that's <coughs> really a great thing. It's mm -hmm. a sign of clean air. So just enjoy it. There's so many natural things out in the woods. And if you have that in your garden, that means you have a very good growing environment. Okay, so thank you, Katie, for that. Let's go to our little mag quiz next, and it's about a tree. Every state has an oak. I think redwood came in second, and that wouldn't have done very well in mid-America. So, and yeah. I think pine came in there pretty close. So we're glad that it's a place, something that grows in all the places in the United States. Okay, let's go to a knockout rose question on line three with Mitzi. Hi there, line three. Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I have probably, they're four years old, knockout rose bushes at my house and also at our church. And I've noticed that all the little maroon sprouts that are coming from the bottom, and yes, we have nothing they on They are. Top. So just wondering if we should just keep waiting until they sprout up, or do I need to cut back? I would say you could give it a couple more days um, and wait to see what the warm, warm weekend does. Um, but I really would believe that this year we're going to be cutting our knockouts back almost to the ground. And it's, it, it won't hurt them. They're going to come back really beautiful and rejuvenated. But we just had a really hard winter this year that, that took roses for a loop. They didn't do so well this year. And we've had really easy winters two years or so in a row mm -hmm. when they sprouted out and got extremely tall. So this is probably more what we could expect to see. So just wait a minute and then cut them back. Okay, thank you for that. And so now everyone who has knockout <coughs> rose questions, you can just listen to the rest of the show because <laughs> it's all the same. All right, let's go to line six about lilacs with Linda. Hi there, line six. Hi, um, I have a question. Have a yellow lilac that is 10, maybe 12, but more likely 10 years old, beautiful, it's never bloomed. Can you tell me why or what I can do to get it to bloom? Hmm. Is it in full sun? Um, no, it's on the north side of my house. Oh. <laughs> and, and the second question I always ask when lilacs don't bloom is, do you prune it? And if so, when? No. Okay. So I think the exposure is probably the biggest problem. Like the bulbs that we talked about, lilacs need to get a lot of solar energy uh, to build up the flower buds for the next year. And, and if you keep them in perpetual shady location like the north side of a building, uh, that, can, that can be a problem. Now, I wonder <coughs> on the yellow one, are there areas below where she can take some of the roots? Yeah, if, if, if she's getting root suckers that, that if it's not grafted, that, that yeah, that's would be what I was okay. Wondering. So if you can do that, you don't have to move the whole shrub, you can just move a part of it, but I don't have a yellow lilac, so I'm not sure no. exactly how that works. But I would get it out of there, at least parts of it, if you can, because it needs sun. And then if you've got a 10-year-old tree and it has grown, then you're going to maybe want to, once you get it established in a new spot, then that's when you start to rejuvenate it. Older wood, take a third of that out, then the second year, the second oldest third, and you know the rest for the third year, I'd say. Okay, well, we don't have much time, but we're going to go quickly to a honeysuckle question with Sharon on line one. Do you have a quick question for us? Uh, yes, I'll make it real quick. Uh, okay. This uh, honeysuckle is probably about six years old, and we've noticed that probably 98% is dead, and I didn't know it was from the uh, hard winter or what, but we use it for privacy and, and uh, kind of a windbreak, too. And I just wondered if we need to cut it the dead off or just hope for the best. We've seen a lot of dead this year. Mm -hmm. um, just It was just a hard winter. There's a lot of um, plant material that just isn't going to probably make it back this year. Again, you could wait a little bit, but um, odds are she, it may, it, it'll probably suck her up from the bottom that she'll get new sprouts, but it may have to be the top removed. Yeah, it may take a year or two to get back up as mm -hmm. a screen, but 
Honeysuckles are, generally speaking, pretty hard right. to kill. Might yeah. want to consider <laughs> some sunflowers <laughs> for this year. It's not great for a privacy screen for this year. But or broom corn. <laughs> or broom corn or uh, some kind of an annual fountain grass, something yeah. that you can use to fill in in the meantime if you've got the space, which sounds like you might have the space. So anyway, that's kind of a sad story for privacy, but um, it won't last forever. No. It will. Honeysuckles will regrow. Wow. The show goes fast. I want to thank you three for all of your expertise and for each person who called in. We thank our viewers. We couldn't do it without you. Well, we hope you get out there, rain or shine, cold or hot, and have a great week gardening. Bye-bye. Thank you.